Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 34. Uh, this session is on all manner of, well, more specifically, the mutual relation between various Polynesian religions. Polynesia is an often undermentioned region of the world, especially in regards to its spirituality, its native spirituality. Now, when I say Polynesian, it's coming from the word in Greek, polis, meaning many, and Greek, nesos, meaning islands, literally many islands. And to define where Polynesia is, is essentially everywhere between New Zealand, Hawaii, and Easter Island. These are thousands of islands, thousands. <clears throat> this could include Tonga, this could include Samoa, the Norfolk Islands, uh, French Polynesia, the Cook Islands, so forth list goes on and on and on and on. The inhabitants, the peoples of these various islands do have their own customs, their own traditions. Each one is individual, but there is a shared history, a shared people. Anywhere between 3000 and 1000 BC, a group of people took off from Taiwan. So originating in Asia. From this point forward, they would spread themselves out across the Pacific tremendously, all the way to the continental United States, effectively or the Americas, I should say. <clears throat> In this beginning time is where we'll be putting our focus. What were the beliefs at this time? Who, these people that were their ancestors, what did they believe? And through looking at their similarities, all of their similar beliefs, we can start to tease this out. So this is a, a wide span topic and somewhat spectacle on my part. Now, Polynesians in these earlier times were matrilineal. The focus was on the woman, which as we know in the course, in this prehistorical time, goddess centricism was prevalent so this is not much of a surprise to us other than to say that this has moved all the way down to south asia where we predominantly find remnants that prove matrilineal societies matriarchal societies in the western world um, in france in the middle east now it's genetic evidence that hints towards this matriocentric uh, culture. And still to this day, in Marquesas, for instance, women are held on the same level as men, nearly, in societal positions. But as time went on, their positions would get lower and lower. And this doesn't just have to do with colonialism. Uh, regardless of the time of history, there was still this practice of labor being traditionally divided. And this is true in all pre prehistoric era. Um, when men are responsible for fishing, for protection, for building, and women collect food, weave baskets, make clothes. And according to the customs of many Polynesians, I hope I keep saying many and not all, right? Um, 
men and women eat separately. There is a, a rather stark distinction between the genders in this way. And interestingly enough, there is polygamy, but it is ruled by the woman. So back in this time, the woman could have more than one husband. And it was much less common for men to marry more than one woman. So in this way, yet again, teasing towards that inherent ancestry of matriarchy not necessarily matriarchy, but matrilineal society. Another thing that unites all these people uh, is the sweet potato and the name for the sweet potato. Now, there is a lot of debate, historically speaking, about where the sweet potato originates. Um, there have been a number of scholars, and this is very controversial, that say that Polynesians reached the Americas uh, way before either, you know, the colonializers or even the Vikings for that matter. And you can point to a few things. You can point to the sweet potato, chickens, coconuts, and bottle gourds. Uh, these things wouldn't have been there otherwise. Now, chickens originated in Asia and made their way across the land to Europe, right? But when colonial people arrived to the Americas, chickens were already here. So there's a question mark. And as we will iterate on a little bit here, the Polynesians were master navigators of the ocean, thus why they reached all of these islands. Their knowledge passed through oral tradition of how to navigate um, is incomparable. They would memorize um, the motion of the stars. They divided it into 32 uh, sections. Uh, they, would, they would be able to read where the horizons of rise would be on the ocean. They were able to discern the weather um, from context clues, how long it would take them to travel, um, how long uh, it would take wild species such as birds in observation of them to reach certain ways, you know, in observing their patterns. Um, they could discern the swelling of the ocean. They could discern through its motion and through the colors of the sea and sky, they were tapped in to the nature of things. They knew how to rightly approach islands. And if they had made it to Easter Island, they would have not been far from South America. And the idea of them trading would have not been out of question. So, in this time that I'm talking about is a pre-colonial era where a variety of religions exist on the Polynesian islands. But as I mentioned before, there is a root to these various beliefs. So we are focusing on what's shared. We're focusing on what unites them. Um, to study specifically Hawaiians or the Maori or the religion of the Cook Islands um, these would be sessions of themselves. I am just focusing on similarities. Um, it is, this is a very expanding topic. So it it's, might be possible that I mix up what beliefs come from where, and I mean no disrespect. Um, it's quite the opposite, actually. So anyhow, um, also as a disclaimer, um, my pronunciation, I read to, to uh, give the resources for the spiritual studies course. This has not been taught to me uh, through, you know, oral tradition. Uh, so, you know, my pronunciation is not proper. So anyhow, we can begin with some more softer aspects of what unites them, most notably this concept of mana. This is a, 
uh, somewhat of a life force, you could call it, an inanimate or animate power that dwells in all things. We, this is not unique to the Polynesians. Uh, we saw this when we studied Finnish paganism in what they called the Itzi. You can also see this in modern and ancient shamanism in what we translate as the spirit, how the spirit is involved in all things. Now, when it comes to the Polynesians, this mana, the spirit, this itsy, whatever, um, could be especially perceptible in women, being that they had the power to reproduce. Um, and then, of course, their chiefs would be in possession of great mana. Now, you don't only find this among the Polynesian people, you also find it among the Melanesian people, this supernatural force or power. The idea here is that mana is a force. It's, it's not necessarily good or bad. It can be dangerous and it can be healing, but it is an energy. So being that this is ultimately coming from Asia, East Asia, maybe we could tie it to the concept of chi. When it comes to the Hawaiians, this mana is involved in, in, in every aspect of the world. There is a mana of every human, a distinct mana. There is one for the rock, for the birds, for the flowers. Um, for everything around us. And again, that's why I would tie it to the shamanistic. And this is the ultimate root of the Polynesian people, this shamanistic force that has found its way across all these islands and has been retained, maintained. It's, you cannot talk about mana without talking about spirits. These things are completely intertwined. Think of it as the thing that gives people power, the power source of the people or anything. This mana could be innate, you could be born with it, or it can be acquired. And in its uh, potency, this could take the form of skills, of leadership abilities, of intelligence. And through intention uh, and prayer and ceremony, perhaps, this mana could be increased and nurtured. Now, on the opposite side of things, or maybe not opposite, another notable concept that is shared throughout Polynesian societies is tapu. That's what the uh, Maori of New Zealand call it, tapu. But we took that word, and now it's in English. It's a loan term, taboo. This was on behalf of Captain James Cook when he visited Tonga in 1777. So this, I'm just going to say taboo from now on, now that we know that it originates with them, um, with the Polynesians, that is, that this is something that is sacrosanct or sacrilegious or forbidden. You ought not touch this. There are strict rules uh, protecting a certain something. It is holy or it is sacred or it ought not be messed with. You could call this an implied uh, restriction, you know, a spiritual restriction even. And you can find this concept all across. Like I mentioned, the Tongans, you can find it in Fiji. You can find it with the Maori, with the Samoans, with the Hawaiians, with the Tahitians, on and on. So the idea is, is once something is taboo, taboo, it is without imposing and without mention. It's not just that you can't approach it, you, you sometimes can't even talk about it, whatever it is. So this could be applied to resources, you know, places, a certain 
uh, arrangement of a forest to prevent it from overexploitation, or maybe certain types of fish, um, and maybe even people, because there, there's this idea of two different kinds, the private taboo and the public taboo. So, you know, this, this could be an object, a person, or a place. You ought not do that. And, you know, it'd be interesting for me right now to talk about how we've applied this concept in modern uh, Western society. You know, what are our taboos? Um, but taboo to the Polynesians would have been completely and utterly respected in this way. And to violate a taboo was a big deal, dire consequences. It could be death, you know, it could be complete neglect. It could be, it's going to be a very serious punishment. Now, when it comes to maybe how taboos um, are applied, it, culturally speaking, you know, one could not see a chief. Uh, the chief was not allowed to eat in their own house. This is a taboo. Or like I mentioned earlier, uh, men eating with women. Women eat with women. Men we eat with men. This is a taboo. You ought not break this rule. And burial grounds. You know, uh, the, these were sacred, protected. You ought not go there. Um, however. There is also a concept, and I believe this is from the Maori, of the Noah. Um, and the Noah is the releasing of taboo. So you have a, a restriction, um, but the chief or maybe a priest could say, this is now available. You know, maybe a home was taboo and maybe a ceremony was done to remove that taboo um, and to make it uh, enterable to make it welcomed. Um, so there is the restriction and there is the release. Now, when it comes to more everyday uh, beliefs or everyday practices of religion, and mind you, we'll get more into the nitty gritty further along, but um, everything that one would do from fishing to building to um, making a canoe to planting there were ways to do it. There were rituals to go along with it. So we're, we're witnessing uh, things are very measured, things are very regimented, and the religion isn't separate from the life that is lived. The two are completely intertwined. Um, you know, unlike modern day where, you know, you put on your suit and tie and you, you put your religion on the back shelf, right? <laughs> um, so when it came to knowing, um, you know, for instance, the navigation and, and all these technical tool or technical skills that they would acquire, this would involve um, incantations, you know, legends, uh, invocations, you know, even mentions of genealogies, um, you know, this 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 was told by this ancestor, so, so on and forth. Like it was very everything had a very wholesome nature behind it. Now, in, in regards to priests, there is this distinction of three different kinds, um, the divine, the inspirational, and the ceremonial priest. So we're seeing specialization, loose specialization of different types of priests, um, which is something I talked about in the uh, How Religion Was Born shamanism session, if you're interested in that, but um, the inspirational pre, uh, priest was more of a mouthpiece of the gods to speak on behalf of the will of the gods. The oracle or the divine priest was one to uh, talk to before important things would happen. So um, this was kind of a permissive priest. Now, when it comes to the ceremonial priest, this would be for special occasions, right? So we're talking about birth, we're talking about marriage, we're talking about death. Now, this isn't too far off, right? This is somewhat recognizable. 
So <clears throat> something that was very important and still is genealogy, as I mentioned. Uh, if you were a chief, you would always tie your genealogy back to a certain deity or to significant ancestors. This was uh, to root yourself with the ancestors was culturally ingrained. So to not know your heritage would be very, very strange, very strange and even pitiful. And, you know, that's... <laughs> In comparison to the modern day, you know, that's an interesting note. So in this tradition, you know, there, there were these various stories, which I'm going to go over quite a few of them today. Um, not nearly all of them. I'm going through some of them, I should say. And these are different stories that are told through oral traditions. Now, I don't, I haven't got to mention this in the course before, but when it comes to these old religions, these older spiritualities, we often want to know what the story was. And it's interesting because the only thing that makes it the story is a book that is a codifier that, that gives us the perception that that was the story. So actually, these are very tenuous uh, shifting entities, these stories. They're not fixed. There isn't necessarily a correct version. There are alterations, there are facts, yes, but I hope you understand what I mean when there is a flexibility in not putting it down. But for the purposes, you know, I just wanted to point that out, but for the purposes, we'll continue. So we're going to start as we have often with these subjects, which is cosmogony, the beginning of things. So here's one version. In the beginning, there was, and I'm gonna, well, I'll try to say these. In the beginning, there was tekor, or the nothing, the void, sound familiar, which then came the parentless void. Tekor Matua, in search for procreation. Interesting, it's searching for procreation. And then came, from this came the night or Tepo. And then tepor, tepor, Teporoa, the long night. And then comes the great night. So the increasing night. Hmm. And gradually from this comes the light glimmering into existence from all corners of the universe. And this came to be called the long standing light. So it seems we've had a duality shift here. The next came dawn. And from the dawn came Timaku, the moisture. And then with this came the cloud of the dawn. And these two things, the moisture and the cloud of dawn, came together to create Rangi, the sky god, which is something that we're going to talk about quite a bit. So interesting that we're receiving the story. And here's the order. Nothing, void, to the parentless void, to the night, to the long night, to the great night, to the light, to the long standing night, to the dawn, to the, to the moisture, to the cloud of dawn, and then to the sky. So this, this is reminiscent of a few traditions. Many traditions start with this cosmic void. In other versions, you find that the universe is likened from a seed to a tree. So there's a base, and then there's roots, and then there's branching out roots, 
which is the form of all things, the fractal like nature. So this is the tree of knowledge. This is the shamanic tree of which you still find with the shamans in Siberia. This is, you know, the tree in the garden of Eden, you know, um, we've seen this many places throughout many cultures. So interesting to note that we're also seeing it here, but this is not the end. Another way or other stories is that the evolution is like a seed growing in a womb, that what makes it happen is what the child does. And the child has this innate searching, this innate willingness to grow, that it wants to feel, that it wants to acquire knowledge, it wants to form, it, it, it has a quickening aspect to it. And a, an evolution from simplicity to complexity. So this is another way that the stories are told. Um, now, when it comes to something that's maybe more recognizable in the myth form, there is this discussion of Rengi, as I mentioned, the sky god, and Papa, which is the mother. I know that's confusing. Papa is the mother earth. And the union of the sky and the earth is the beginning of all things. Now, let's take a moment and observe the fact that this is just like the Greeks. <laughs> this is Gaia and Uranus. This is the beginning of the Greek story as well. So mutual tradition. That's why I think it's important to focus on what was the beginning of Polynesia in regards to spirituality. Now, in other ways, you know, in, for instance, in Tahitian mythology, we have a supreme deity, Ta'aroa, Ta which is the source of growth. And they say that he emerged from a cosmic egg. And gosh, we, this goes to Orphism. This goes to Slavic paganism. This goes to all manner of occultism. Um, so in this egg hatches, right? And makes the sky and all other parts of the earth out of the egg. He filled the world with creatures and things um, and that he bestowed blessings and curses to the things of which were created. And this is why one must appease the creator deity. So here we're seeing monotheism of a certain type in the ancient Polynesians. So we're seeing, okay, I'm going to wait to reflect later. So, you know, we're already seeing these different cases of creation being a process of growth and mentioning the prime, the primordial chaos. And we're also seeing the mother father aspect, right? Ayo and uh, Ayo and Po, which is a Hawaiian terminology, the male and female forces, the masculine, the feminine, those that were there in the great watery chaos at the beginning of time. Alongside them, the creator deity, Ku, pronouncing day and night and making the world possible. So we're seeing a lot of similarities with various cosmogenies across the world, naturally, of course, which shows their relation to one another is the point that I'm trying to make here. Now, to get back to Rangi and Papa, or the sky and the earth, we're going to focus on this a little bit. So these two were connected. They were locked in an embrace. So the sky and the earth were almost indiscernible from each other. And all manner of gods and creations were stuck inside of this embrace. And the gods uh, started to question this. There was a willingness for them to grow and for them to have their own world. 
And the one that stepped forward ultimately was Tain. And we're going to talk about many of these gods much later. Tain steps forward, and after arguments with the others, he says it is best to separate them, to pull them apart, so that the heaven can stand far above us and the earth can lie under our feet. Let the sky become as a stranger to us, but the earth remain close to us as a nursing mother. So this choice to separate them involved the creation of all things. This was where you could say humanity begins in the separation between the sky and the earth, all things that were concealed inside of the bodies of Rangi and Papa. Now, one of these gods did not want them to separate. This is the god of storms, Tawuri Matia. This is the god, the father of winds, of storms, uh, and he did not like that this was done. So he would create all matter of hurricanes and storms to make sure that the earth or Papa would never become too beautiful. You see what they're doing here? And that he was ultimately following his father he would hide in the boundless skies he would cling to the father so this is sets up a kind of rivalry between tain and by the way tain is ascribed many things but we'll just say that he's the god of land or the forest versus the sky god and this is the rivalry the battle between land and the waters per se. Now, Rangi and Papa were hurt, but they were also proud of what had been created in the world that became, but they, they missed each other. And Rangi would cry. And this is why the world is damp in the early morning because it's all of his tears. <laughs> this is sad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the morning mists are Papa's sadness. That's where she's sad, you know, on behalf. And that's where the mist come from. Um, so they, they still long to embrace with each other. Now, there's a few stories here where humans enter the picture. You know, it could be that there was this messenger bird that was pulling a vine to clothe the land that was bare at the time and to provide shade. And this vine um, decomposed, and from that decomposition came a bunch of shapeless maggots. And from it, uh, Tangaloa, or another word for Tain, I believe, comes to make these maggots into human shape. He straightens them out, you know, he gives them hands and legs. And then he gives them a soul. He gives them their aliveness. And this myth is thought to have been an allegory of evolution from primitive things. So although it might seem like the story is presented as transformative, um, immediately transformative, it could be a simple reference to evolution, how things started very small and how we were maggots. <laughs> considerable, considerable. But if you look elsewhere for this myth, um, the, the god Tain is the one that started it all. The god of land is the one that started it all. And in this case, he took clay, red clay, from the four corners of the world. He mixed them together and spit in the mixture and molded it in the shape. And there was this use of a special uh, white clay that was used to form the head. And this creation, the difference here in other creation stories, because we see the use of clay in man, even in the Hebrew Bible. 
But here, the woman was created first. And the son of the God and the woman was the first man. So man came second. And yet again, here is the case of um, the Polynesians pointing out matriarchal focus, the primordial goddess worship, this inherited tradition of the mother coming first, you know. Um, yeah, there's a lot to say about that. An interesting twist on what we're used to seeing, especially in the Western world. Now, if we're going to talk about the beginning of things, let's talk about the afterlife. Excuse me for a moment. Now, this is various and pretty ambiguous, if I'm being honest with you, but we do see in various Polynesian cultures that ghosts are a natural phenomena. There is not only the fact that they're around, but they have the power to possess the living. This is not paranormal to them, you know? This is something that has been inherited and understood in the culture for as long as we can say, right? So for instance, in, you know, taking it as an example with the Samoans, if a person um, disrespects the dead, says something poor of somebody else. The dead can punish them by possessing them. There is this thought that the spirits will enter through your armpits and remain in your abdomen or in the back of your neck. And you can know when this is happening or when they are attempting to, if you feel a chill. So there's some good paranoia for you. <laughs> that a ghost might be trying to take your body away. And if this was the case, or if you know this is being attempted, there were rituals and there were medicines to make sure this didn't happen. Now, when it comes to the Maori, um, there is this interesting case of a place, Spirit Bay, which is um, on the very Northern East tip of the islands of New Zealand. And after death, their spirits would leap off the rocks into the ocean. And after this, who knows? But I should also mention that in many cases, the conversation of the afterlife is taboo. <laughs> so there might be a lot more to say about this than what any information I can get, right? Um, or should be able to get for that matter in a respectful, in a respectful way, right? Um, but this idea of leaping to, to move on to the next realm, I find very interesting. That's, that's very curious to me. And that is where through the leap at Spirits Bay, is where you would move into the realm of the dead, leave the mortal realm. Now, this is a, parano uh, a, a paranormal site. Um, there's legends that people have seen spirits uh, traveling across the beach um, at night, and they all move to a single spot and disappear. And if anybody tries to interact with them or delay them, they will be ignored. People camp here. <laughs> it's true. Now, this idea isn't just with the Maori. If you see uh, the Hawaiians have a certain belief too, that to enter the other world or the underworld, you have to jump off something. And in which case in this tradition, there's a reference to a breadfruit tree. Um, you know, this is a way of spirits returning uh, to, or not returning to, but you know what I'm trying to say. And there's also this mutual belief in stories that people can return from the dead. And yet again, this is something that ties to the Greeks. 
So in um, Hawaii, it's the legend of Kalakua or Kalakea. I really hope I'm saying these things right. The bride from the underworld. And this is directly analogous to the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurit so the only difference is, is that in the Hawaiian story, the lover actually brings back the lady. She survives. However, in the Greek, that's, that's not true. <laughs> so, you know, they must have had the same story, is my point. They must have. And they, through time, changed how the story was told. I don't know, guys. That's so fascinating to me. So, you know, in other traditions, we see that the Polynesians uh, feel, know, uh, traditionally ascribe that the ancestral land of the spirits is in the West. And that spirits can return to that land and return to the earth from that land. This is a kind of mixed bag, I know. Now, there are concepts of punishment, you know, for instance, in different Polynesian traditions, uh, the souls of common people, along with people who are victims of, of black magic, um, are burned. They're destroyed by fire <laughs> in the afterlife. But if you are of the upper class, you know, this, there is a place for you to be among your ancestors. And if I'm correct, I, I, you know, stand corrected, please correct me. But I think this is more centralized with the Hawaiians in the concept of Wakia and Milu. Um, so the Wakia would be the place for the upper class, for the chiefs, um, that would be a kind of quiet and peaceful place, a place of comfort. Um, and most notably, not too many people are there. This is a very special exemption. And that people have even like said that uh, this place is observable. Maybe this is other traditions, but that people who are sailing might see it for a fleeting moment. But as they move closer, they'll see that it disappears like a mirage in the desert. Um, that it's kind of, you know, interdimensional in this way. However, you know, uh, there are other cases where they say that the souls move to the hidden land of Cain, or, you know, they move to the fairy land in the west of Fata Morgana. Um, I don't know, this is a bit confusing, but if we're going to embrace this more upstairs downstairs conception then the downstairs is milu and there they say that the um the food is lizards and butterflies they say that this is a place where the gods or the akos uh play wild games at night it's lawless and disorderly um and noisy so i don't know i mean maybe it's not as doom and gloom as the as the regular old hell conception um but it does seem to have that polarity to it now <clears throat> when it comes to the actual how the treatment of the dead goes down we can point to the maori and there is this uh ritual for when somebody is about to pass on um and they know somebody is about to pass on so this ritual is to remove sadness and to clear out the spirits of this person. Um, and the idea here is that if somebody is not cleared, if somebody is not, you know, tr if this ceremony is not performed, then somebody can become restless and wander in the afterlife and thus ghosts. Which, you know, if you go way back to the very first session of this course, this is what you find in, um, in some form in spiritualism. Um, anyhow, you know, someone's nearing death or somebody just died uh, and they need to get to them, them to, the, to the priest very quickly uh, to help them be able to leave properly. Um, and in this way, you know, 
uh, it's also a belief that um, that the spirits can watch over the living. They're not going to do it forever, but they can in a seemingly altruistic, beneficial fashion. And that if and when they go to you know gravestones or place of you know the rest for the dead, there there is a paying respects to those that have died for this reason, which is interesting because people still yet in in like irreligious western society go to graves as if and talk to them as if they hold this belief too it's just made literalized when studying you know in, in this particular case the mari customs anyhow let's move on to some actually let me let me let me back this up a little bit so we're seeing not only various cosmogony stories that are taken in by the Polynesians. You have the Orphic egg. You have the uh, father sky, mother earth separation. You have the movement from nothing into everything, from darkness into light. So whoever, whatever the beliefs of the initial Polynesian ancestors must have clearly had and this is again my just patchwork you know I, I stand to be corrected but they must have had a flurry of information um that the original people of the world the original religions of the world all shared and that this slew of different stories some would pick just one and roll with it and others pick the other and roll with it. I don't know. I'm just trying to put some things together. And in regards to death, I think the ambiguity that we're seeing here and the mixed bagness um, of not mentioning what happens after, of saying there's a spirit world, of saying that there's a good place and a bad place and all the various ways here, I think it's just um, the uh, deviation, the variation that came from a shamanic approach to death, which is that we are nature and nature is us. And there is a continuum that is kind of taboo because to speak about it and to discern it means that you don't fundamentally understand the very principle of shamanism. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to stop that here. Let's move on and talk about the gods. But first off, I'm going to kind of it's not quite the gods because I want to talk about the most popular per se outside of islands and, you know, inside mayhaps, mayhaps perhaps, um, is the trickster. And the trickster is mostly a demigod by the name Maui. And uh, Maui, and I hope I'm saying that right too, is either a cultural hero, but most notably a trickster god in all manner of polythe, Paul, not polytheism of the Polynesians, in all manner of Polynesian mythology. So it wasn't that Maui's worshipped, or Mai. I'm gonna say Maui. Please don't. Please, please be right. So you see this all across Polynesia, as far as New Guinea this concept of the trickster. And as has been brought up before, the trickster is a very old shamanic trope. We see this very loosely with Hermes in the Greeks. We see this more accurately in, the, in how it survived in Europe, in the Norse with Loki. And we see this go over to the Native Americans um, from a long before ancestor and a long before uh, religious tradition, which surmounted in different uh, stories of coyote in the natives. Now, the trickster is always going to be breaking rules, breaking the rules of humans, breaking the rules of gods, destroying norms, challenging authority. Now, in a society that has very, um, everything's very decided, you know, there, there is um, a tradition for when you do this. There's a tradition when you do that. You say these things, right? It makes sense that the embrace of a trickster god would be a type of catharsis for them, much in the same way as 
you know, East Asians having Zen as a way, as a pressure release from all of the taboos and rules of society. Um, <clears throat> Maui can shape shift. We've seen that one before in Loki as well, and many other traditions, mind you. And he also has superhuman strength. Uh, you know, in some versions, he's a, a handsome young man who's trying to woo the ladies. And in other versions, he's an old wandering priest. Uh, he's an old wandering priest, uh, for instance, in Tahiti, a wise man, a prophet, and was deified. Um, there are these universal stories of Maui across Polynesia. Um, this one of this uh, magic fish hook, which mind you, you do find a magic fish hook story in Asia still yet, but that's a whole nother topic. Um, you know, Maui was made fun of for not being able to catch fish. So he decided to trick all of his brothers and they took him out and he uh, threw down the magic uh, fish hook and he told them to keep rowing. And he said, if you look, uh, the line will break. So don't look. And they're pulling, they're pulling, they're paddling, they're paddling. And they're pulling up the Hawaiian islands. This is one of the stories. And this is how the Hawaiian islands emerged from the sea. Um, and when one of them looked back, uh, it broke the line. And if he had not, it was said that there would have been more islands. So, you know, here we're seeing that kind of resemblance with the natives as well, where they have stories for why there are geological formations um, in, you know, in oral traditions and in mixed in the bag of spiritual traditions, right? Um, <clears throat> you also have this story of a woman um, complaining that the sky was too low. And Maui wanted to impress her, you know, and he felt that people should have more uh, daylight for, you know, um, raising food and uh, cooking it and uh, making clothes. So he uh, pushed up the sky. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the same respect that, you know, that he put the sun in a net and he beat it with his grandmother's magic jawbone, which is something I'd love to dissect more, what, what that's a reference to. Um, and now the sun limps across the sky because Maui beat it up so bad. <laughs> so again, you know, these, these trickster essences, but, I, but what I find really curious is this story of how Maui, um, in you know in the uh, decided or was the one that brought fire to the people and there are different versions of how maui did this um but right away i want to say this is prometheus so yet again we're tying the greek here um pointing yet again to this i don't know i don't know man there's so much speculation here but taking the fire from the gods the hero of mankind taking the fire from the gods, this story. And, you know, in one version, Maui goes to the underworld and he's uh, messing around with the earthquake god. You know, he's impersonating his dad um, and he duels with this underworld uh, deity and beats him up, um, you know, and the... <clears throat> The underworld deity pleads with him to, to spare him, uh, but uh, he says no. <laughs> and so he takes, he takes the fire up to the upper world and he gives it to the people. He learned of the secret of the gods that was that fire had been hidden. The eternal fire had been hidden in trees. And so this is the knowledge of rubbing sticks together to create sparks. So this was, yet again, you're seeing that something that might seem very mundane to a survivalist is a part of an oral tradition, you know? Um, you know, it gets confusing because Maui proceeds in different ways. Sometimes like in Tonga, there are three different Mauis. There's a Maui, uh, and I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but one of them that I find interesting is that there's a Maui 
who ha bears the earth on his shoulders. Um, and every once in a while, he's nodding to sleep. And if he falls asleep, there will be earthquakes. Um, so the people will stamp, you know, they'll stamp all across the ground traditionally to wake Maui up so that earthquakes don't happen. I don't know. I find that so, I don't, I don't know what to call it. I find that so um, wholesome. Now, <clears throat> we're just going to take some time here in, in a more closing way to talk about not all the deities, because I would be remiss, you know, but the, the specific deities that are shared across the Polynesians and what wisdom we can glean from this. So the one that I'm not going to spend too much time on is one that I've already mentioned, and this is Tain. And so in Maori, this is the god of forests and birds. And in Tahiti, Tain is the god of peace and beauty. And in Hawaii, Cain is the god of procreation and is you know, uh, the ancestor of chiefs and commoners of all mankind, as we talked about before. So here we can immediately see that Tain must have been a part of the original beliefs. And likewise, his rival, Tangaroa. And this is the god of, again, of either storms or of the seas, the one that's fighting with Cain. So, you know, in the different names, I called him Tawuri earlier, the god of weather, of thunder, of lightning, of winds, clouds, and storms. He wanted to punish his brother for the choice they made of separating the earth and sky, or Rangi and Papa, if you recall. And so he, uh, he invented hunting, agriculture, woodcutting, fishing and cooking for the humans in order to ruin the land. <laughs> Interesting, huh? And that the war was always between the land and the ocean because to worry was the one that caused heavy rains and thunderstorms. So this is his attempt to overcome the land in punishment and to make sure it never becomes too beautiful. So, right, I, I, there's some interesting notes there, right? But you see Tawuri or, you know, uh, Tengaroa across. And I'm going to give a good list here. You see, um, you see Tengaroa in Manahiki as the one that is the origin of fire. And that Mar Mari actually kills him. Um, and brings him back to life through incantations. You see him in Mang Mangaya as uh, the, the father or the, um, how do I want to say this? The child of Vatia and Papa or daylight and the foundation of the earth. Uh, they said that Tengaroa is, uh, had yellow hair. So when they first saw um, the Europeans, interestingly enough, they thought they were his children. <laughs> you also see in uh, Rerotanga, he's the god of sea and fertility, and these wood carvings of him are still famous. Now you see a difference where sometimes in, in Western Polynesia, he actually is the supreme creator god, but then in Eastern Polynesia, he is equal to Tain, and not supreme. So then you have, you know, instances uh, where you find him in the Bel uh, the Bellona Islands, in Rennell Islands. You, you can see him in uh, Rapa Nui, uh, the Marquesas Islands. I mean, on and on and on. So this this one is clearly an ancestral uh, hearkening back to that original spirituality. Um, this one is especially. Uh, notorious. Um, and it would make sense that the weather and the waters would have even more predominance than the land deity to the Polynesians given where they live, right? Now, something else I want to mention is Hina, and I hope I'm saying that right, 
uh, hina, or as we could see the word mahina in Hawaiian means moon. So this is the goddess of the moon. And then you jump over to New Zealand to the Maori and you see that the name for moon is mahina. And so hina is this holdover from this ancient time is my, you know, restitching. And Hina is coincidentally the mother of Maui in these traditions or in some traditions um, or maybe in all. I hope to not get that wrong. But you will find Hina in some form, in some legends, in New Zealand, in Tonga, in the Hervey Islands, in the Fate Islands, in, um, in Samoa. You'll find, it, you'll find her all throughout. And then lastly... You know, when I was mentioning Rangi and Papa earlier, you know, the father sky and the mother earth, this is translated to Wakia and Papa in the Hawaiian tradition. So this is something that was in the original uh, fabric of the spiritual tradition of the Polynesians. Now, I, I say that because the journey between uh, New Zealand and Hawaii is the true borders of the Polynesian world in the ancient in the ancient sense and in the modern sense. So what 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 can we glean from all of this that's been that's been mentioned today, right? So in the many versions or in the many descriptions of the creation story, in the ambiguity of and you know some of the conceptions we find in the afterlife, in the mutuality of some of the deities, in the very concept of the trickster god, we can make a few th syntheses of what the originating culture was like. Now, uh, again, all, just all my patchwork and my curiosity here, very shamanically oriented and tied to the source and tied to the people that would become the Native Americans tied to the people that would move to um, Europe as well. There was a fanning out, but they must have originally been in the true melting pot of what would later become various paganisms. There are just too many coincidences, too many eerily similar tropes for this to not be true um the idea that the moon is a goddess the idea of her triple form i didn't get to mention that the idea of separating uh the sky father and mother earth the many weird analogies to greek myth I haven't seen that in other paganisms. Um, <clears throat> and the cosmogony especially is curious. It could tie them back to the Sumerians. It could tie them to the esoteric orders that would move into Europe. Um, so th there's a point being, I should say, it's very likely that I will spend time concentrating on particular cultures like, like the Tahiti, like the Hawaiians, like the Maori. They all deserve their own time. But as a, as a, as a historical observation and as a mutuality, these languages aren't mutually intelligible. It's like saying uh, we as English speakers can understand French people and can understand Spanish people because it all has it all comes from Latin. It's a big leap. But but you know, much like with the Europeans, there were core beliefs before all these things came about. There was a religion of the Proto-Indo-Europeans that they brought in. So um, you know, each of them, each culture has their own due respect, their own due traditions. Um, but in observing all this, we can really start to get a glimpse into the ancient past and the interrelation between the movement, uh, between the various religious movements across the world. And the move from the primordial goddess worship 
of the Paleo and Neolithic into what would become the preserved polytheistic or paganistic beliefs of the Polynesians. <laughs>